Welcome to the Black Knight Nation podcast, your source for the latest information about your Army Black Knights, with your host, Sal Interdonato. Hey, how's it going, Black Knight Nation? We're here with a, this is a very special podcast. We're doing things a little bit differently tonight. We're getting a, a reunion with the 1995 Army football team, a team who went 5-5-1, five, five and one, who played uh, Notre Dame down to the, the last second, who um, also had a great showing at Washington and really set the tone for the 1996 team. We're here with a bunch of members. Um, we, we, we're here with a bunch of members of the uh, – 1995 team, and we're just going to talk memories of a, of a team that, you know, would have celebrated its 25th year uh, this year, maybe outside of, um, you know, uh, a, a Lincoln Financial Field, right, for the Army-Navy game that unfortunately didn't happen, but happened at Mikey Stadium and Black Knights had a big win. Uh, guys, really appreciate the time and talking about this team, and uh, I guess we could start introducing ourselves from the top. Uh, first, Jim, 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 why don't you get started uh, what your role was on the team, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Yep. Thanks, Sal. Uh, Jim Cantaloupe, uh, class of 96. Um, I was our defensive captain, and I was our, our safety on the team. And my goal is just to try to get everyone playing together and, uh, and, and go out there and, and win football games, play as a team. Okay, Abdullah. Make yeah, sure uh, Abdullah Muhammad, uh, class of 96, obviously. I will. Yeah, for those who don't know, uh, my real name, Abdullah. <laughs> Abdullah Muhammad, action is kind of going. Can, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there we go. I think my connection kind of went out there, but you, you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we're good. Uh, Joe, Joe, tell us your role, uh, what, what position you played and what your role was on the team. Yeah, so uh, I'm Joe Triano, also class of 96. I was a uh, fullback, um, backing up John, the legend Conroy, who uh, should be popping back up here any second now. Here he comes. Um, but, yeah, I've played fullback on the team and um, just one of the one of the greatest experiences I've had um, in my lifetime was to be part of this team. So. Uh, appreciate you bringing us all back. No problem. How about you, Tom? Yeah, Tom Barrell, I was the uh, defensive tackle uh, in the 95-96 team. Uh, basically, just tried to not make a fool of myself on national TV as much as possible. Um, other than that, <laughs> just hanging in there. Gotcha. How about you, Jim? Uh, Jim Zopolis, uh defensive back and uh, special teamer, and I tried not to look as small as everybody else on the field, but that was impossible, uh, you know, and uh, tried not to uh, break legs on Philadelphia's uh, uh, pavement of a football field in our final year. Gotcha. Then we have uh, John Conroy on the bottom. John, tell us a little bit about yourself and your role on the F Army football team. Yeah. John Connolly from Southside Chicago. Okay, still uh, born and raised there, still living here right now. All right, uh, I was one of a multitude of fullbacks on the football team, and uh, you know, lucky enough to uh, get some time to play and uh, and do whatever I could to help the team. And uh, just thankful I had a, the opportunity to play there and play with all the people that we did. Uh, I had some great times, some great stories, and uh, and uh, it's great you guys all together here back again. Today. Yeah, this was a team that was featured in the book of Civil War written by John Feinstein, right? I mean, that's what really got me into sports writing, to be honest with you guys. I read that book, and it was so detailed on the, the season that um, I was writing at the time uh, for a small newspaper, and that really sparked my interest in Army football. And uh, who knew I was going to become a beat writer for 12 years following the team? It was just a, just a great season, a season to remember for you guys, no doubt. I mean, um, a lot of it was 
was focused on the Navy side. I just want to ask you guys, each of you, maybe one at a time, you guys can say what your favorite moment of the season was. And maybe you have some stories that maybe didn't make the book. What are like, what are the most interesting stories that didn't make that book that maybe people would enjoy? So, I mean, let, let's start, let's start with uh, uh, Jim Cannon. What, 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 talk, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, you know, if you look back on that season, you know, some of the most memorable games are actually the ones, you know, we we didn't win. You know, uh, the Washington game, the Notre Dame game. You know, and I think those are the games that kind of made us who we were as a team. If you look at, obviously, how we finished the season against, against Navy, but I look at Boston College and, uh, you know, how we came back after the Notre Dame loss and uh, – and really handed it to, to Boston College. That was probably, I mean, obviously it was in the book, but probably one of the, the, the greatest wins I think we had, you know, is the whole time we were there um, you know, over the four years was probably that Boston College game. Joe, what do you remember? What, what's your biggest memory of the season? Man, I, I have to say, I think, um, you know, going back to the, uh, going back to the Notre Dame game, um, just, you know, looking back over how that game kind of went. Um, I had a lot of my friends, I grew up in Northeastern Pennsylvania. A lot of my friends, you know, were hitting me up for tickets because they wanted to come and see Notre Dame, didn't care who Notre Dame was playing, but you know, they, they were able to get some free tickets. So they wanted to come and showed up all decked out in their Notre Dame gear. And, and just the way that we, you know, really just gave it to them, uh, for 60 minutes. I remember standing on the sidelines, watching that play uh, where we went for two, you know, rather than kick the extra point and tie the game, we went for two and, and tried for the win. Um, and just for a split second there, you know, I was standing on the sidelines from where I saw um, looked like we had won the game, looked like we had gotten across uh, with Ron Lashinsky and, and won the game and God for just a second, you know, I thought we had beat Notre Dame and Ron Paulus and Lou Holtz and just, you know, I had grown up hating Notre Dame and that was one of the reasons I went to, uh, went to West Point to play against Notre Dame. I saw him on the schedule. So, um, you know, that, that sticks out for me as uh, one of my greatest memories of the year. When you guys think about the call to go for two in that Notre Dame game, is there any, do you, do you, are there any regrets for that? Do you think that maybe the, the extra point should be, should have been kicked or were you all for at the, at the time and still now are you all for going? For field so, the thing, so the thing I'll tell you is I, I don't know about everybody else, but we came out in, uh, I think it was the next Monday morning, um, at Monday at lunch. So we used to have uh, meetings at lunch. Uh, we meet before the rest of the core and then go upstairs in Washington Hall and we'd have our meetings. I remember going up there and Coach Sutton like started off the meeting with apologizing for going for two. And I will tell you quite honestly, that Monday at noon was the first time I even thought about kicking the field goal, kicking the extra point and like tying the game. Um, I, it, it never even registered with me. Like, why the hell would you do that? You, we hadn't, we had them on the ropes, you know, that, that, Kid made the head, kid made the head of his life. You know, I think it was, uh, um, was Ivory Covington. Ivory, Ivory Covington. Yeah, Ivory Covington made the head of his life. All I can do at this point, you know, almost 50 years old, is just say, hey, I made the play. But nine times out of ten, Ron Lashinsky makes it in the end zone, and we win that game. So, hey, no thoughts whatsoever about ever kicking that, that extra point. It's not why we were there. Do you think that life, just to say anybody, do you think that life would have been different if you guys won that game? Or do you think anything would have would have changed for you? Or No, but I, I don't. But I, you guys can answer for yourselves, but I don't think so. I mean, other than the fact we could have had beaten Notre Dame on our, on our resume, um, <laughs> which obviously would have been a great accomplishment, um, you know, one of the coaches said it after the game or one of the players that about going for two points is, you know, we represent the United States army and we're always going to play to win. And, you know, I don't like, like Tom and I think everyone on this call <clears throat> probably agrees with, you know, there was only one option in our mind and that was to go for the win. 
You see it today. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. I, I think at that time too, is 95 was last year that there were actually ties and no overtime. So to me is to just, you know, resort to the fact that we were going to, all right, ties good enough. Um, never in a million years. And I mean, it was like my dad always used to say, it's like kissing your sister. Um, you just don't go for ties. You go for the win, go for the jugular. Uh, I think that to Tom's point is even if we beat them, I think the impact was the same. When we walked out of the tunnel to get to the bus, I'm not sure there was eye contact made with a single Notre Dame player because they were looking at the ground because I think that deep down inside they knew they were beat, maybe not on the scoreboard. Uh, but we took it to them. I mean, fourth quarter, uh, they didn't know what happened. And uh, to me, is I think that uh, maybe sometimes you look back at the losses and it's shaped me more, uh, more so than the wins. I know we all would have gladly lined up for a fifth period. I don't know if they would. Exactly. Oh. Yep. It's a good point. I mean, if there was overtime back then, I mean, like you said, you had worn them down. It's probably yeah, your your game to win. Um, Abdul, what what will you? What's your biggest memory of of, of that season of the nineteen ninety five season? Yeah, I mean, there's so many memories to be honest with you, uh, Sal. Uh, I mean, obviously Notre Dame, uh, the Navy game. I mean, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to say one thing is greater than the other. But, I, I, you know, I would definitely say, I mean, obviously being four years in a row, uh, not having to experience losing the Navy. Um, I think it, for me, 25 years later, it, it feels good to say that we never lost the Navy, you know, especially after the 96 team won. And then we, we lost, I think it was 15, 20 years in a row. Um, you know, we kind of took that for granted. You know what I mean? I, I, I didn't know what it was like to lose to them. So, yeah. So, um, I mean, for me today, looking back on it, uh, I think that th that that was a huge accomplishment saying that we we never lost to them because not many teams can say that. You know, if you think about it, to say that you never lost to Navy. So um, to me, I think today that's probably the biggest accomplishment is, is, is to definitely four years in a row. Yeah, agreed. It, it's got to be an incredible feeling for those um, to finish uh, your career with a win over Navy, the fourth straight win over Navy, right? I mean, that's something that you could definitely take with you for forever, right? Uh, how important for you guys was that, or how, what what did that mean for you guys to finish strong um, and have that have that Navy win as a, as the, the final memory of your football career? I mean, we're in very elite company, I think. You know, we're one of only just a handful of classes that we're, uh, you know, that are able to say that, you know, we're 4-0 against Navy. So, I mean, that, you know, one of the things that will, um, I think, define us um, as a class, um, you know, just having done that. And I think going back to one of your, your earlier points, and, you know, I think one of the things that sticks out with the Army teams, you know, today, and Coach Munkin, um, you know, says it, you know, all the time is that, you know, most of the players on these teams would not be even offered a walk on um, opportunity with a lot of the teams that we play. And, you know, a lot of the teams, you know, the Notre Dames, the Washingtons, like they're a bunch of thoroughbreds. And, you know, by the time that game is over, they want nothing more to do with us. I mean, they are physically and mentally beat, um, no matter what the scoreboard says, um, you know, they know who we were. Hey, Joe, I take that a step further, too, though. I mean, like, I, if you really think about it, how many people can walk away from their college career saying they won their last game, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we were able to do. So. Well, we almost didn't do it. And so to yeah. me, it's, you know, we're yeah. good on the sideline first. Which never should have happened. Uh, you know, if they if they just kicked a field goal, you know, it's a totally different. It's what, 16, you know, 16, 7. Hey, we're and, not supposed to talk about nope. that. We're supposed to talk about the drive. Okay, so that's what's leading up to the drive. So what's success so great about the drive? We drive down, you know, you know, big con where I, John, I got to hear what it felt like, you know, punching it through, but it almost didn't happen again. So I'm fired up. We win, right? Or like victory, victory. Everybody's running victory. So we run the nickel out on the field, right? Should have never happened. I'm standing the sideline going, victory, victory, yeah. Vic Coach Burnett grabs me by the neck. He's like, victory. Get over in the nickels, Zopolis. So the last guy running on the field was me. I was so excited 
I had no clue what was going on. And the last play of the college career, I barely made it onto the field to get into a you know nickelback position to ride a guy out of bounds to at least prevent him from you know going for that Hail Mary pass. So I mean that's what it meant to me is I totally lost my head that there was, you know, after the drive, punching it through, you know, and and stopping them on a Hail Mary. I only, we almost had 10 people on the field. Sorry, guys. No doubt. Uh, John, John's been in and out. Hopefully we get him back to talk about the drive. Uh, Joe, maybe you could shed some light a little bit about th that drive and, you know, how it really came together for you guys at the end in that Navy game. I mean, it's just, you know, just the team and, and, you know, how we, you know, spent those four years just believing in each other and, you know, whether we were, you know, no matter where we were on the field, um, you know, we just had a belief among everybody in that huddle that, you know, we were going to get the job done. Um, you know, hopefully John is able to get back on here and talk about that. But I, I think, you know, that's one of the things that, that made it possible is that nobody ever lost, um, you know, lost their belief in the fact that we were going to do it. Absolutely. Yeah, I, think, I think you look at that drive and, and that goes down, no doubt, in the Army-Navy history, right, as one of the greatest drives in, in, in the rivalry. And you look at the last couple of years in these games that have come down, maybe not last year when Navy had a little bit of the upper hand, but you look at when the streak was broken and you look at, like, the drive that they had and Ahmad Bradshaw, I mean, it, it had to bring back a lot of memories for you guys about what happened in the 1995, right, when, when the Army broke break the streak and does it in almost – uh, it's a little bit of a, a similar fashion. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, I think one of the things that, that I wanted to bring up, too, is if you think about we won all four games, we were fortunate enough to win all four games, but we very easily could have been 0-4 versus 4-0. Every one of those oh, games. Six points. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, every one of those games really came down to a final play or a kick or Hell, I don't remember. I just know that they yeah. were close. Yeah. Every one of them. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Well, yeah. Adrian, right. what's it, I mean, when you're playing in a game like that where you know, you can't really take a down off in a game like that, right? Every down, every yard means so much in those rivalry games, especially we we in the Army Navy games. What is that like when, when you're you're playing in a game like that? Well, that, that Army-Navy game has a definitely um, a very special meaning for me. Uh, so I was injured in the Notre Dame game. I had a freakish injury where I, I tore three ligaments, and Tommy B stepped up like a madman with his hair on fire and uh, handled business that game. Um, so I busted my behind. Uh, and, you know, during the regular season, going to all the games, watching these guys continue to get the job done and, uh, you know, fighting, fighting, fighting for each other. And – my sole purpose was just to be able to get back on the field and just to play one down in that game. And uh, thankfully, uh, we were in a position where, um, even though I probably wasn't uh, ninety percent, or I probably wasn't even seventy-five percent ready, uh, coach blessed me off to say, "Hey, go in there, do what you can." And I probably hopped around, made a fool of myself. Um, but just to be, you know, back in uniform with these guys, uh, you know, getting scrappy and and trying to make a play, even though I probably did more damage to the team, you know, not playing um, at 100%. Um, it, it meant the whole world to me, and it's something I'll never forget just to be able to suit up for that last game of my career. Come on, Adrian. 75%, you're still more athletic than me. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I think a lot of us went into that game knowing, obviously, I mean, except for, except for Jim, um, that's the last game we're ever going to play, but we're ever going to put a football helmet on too. Um, so, you know, like we are, you know, we take the, the term leaving it on the field um, to a different level at that point, you know, we know like that's it. Um, so, you know, that, that I think adds a lot more intensity to the game too, as seniors in that game. Was there yeah. with this team, was there, um, a motto or something that a rallying point for this team before even the season started. I think reading the book, I think I recall a couple of things. Was there anything specifically that you guys can remember that really um, fired you up for the season and maybe got you guys, um, you know, really, really uh, going as far as just mentally and re prepared, ready to go. I 
if if I can jump in, I, I don't know who else wants to jump in on this one. Um, I don't know if we had a specific model, Jim. Do you remember? Not not for the, we might have. Cause, so normally, Coach Sutton and the and the, uh, and the coaches had some sort of like motto um, that we sort of carried through uh, like the first four quarters. He sort of broke down the first quarter of the season, um, and then I think twelve was another one one year. I can't remember. So. I don't remember anything specific for this season, for, for the 95 season. Um, I just know going into our last year, uh, for me, and I'm sure, you know, the, the guys will chime in and uh, give their opinion, but it was just about personal pride. Uh, we knew we were uh, big underdogs in a lot of the, the big games against Washington, Notre Dame, BC, et cetera. And we just wanted to go out like champions and, and fight and show the world what we're capable of. Um, one thing I know about this, this, this team and all the academy, all our, uh, all the, all the army teams, is that we're, you know, we're the, for the most part, typical underdogs. We're not the, the five-star, four-star, maybe even three-star blue chip athletes. Um, and I think for me that made it a lot more fun being able to prove to the to the football world uh, that we can compete on any field on any given day. And obviously that still continues to this day with what. Um, what the current current program is demonstrating. For those following along and watching uh, live, if you have any questions or comments, please uh, feel free to send them in. We'll we'll try to get the, the guys to answer answer them. And uh, we welcome in uh, Kevin Gleason to the Kevin to our live video. Kevin covered the team for the Times Tower Record, and uh, great to have you, Kevin. Thanks, Sal. It's great to be here. I am sorry I'm a little late. I was rushing home from dinner. No problem, no problem. Uh, what are your fondest memories of covering this squad, the 1995 team, uh, Kev? Well, I'll tell you what, there's a lot of them. I mean, uh, I, I was just, I had to refresh my memory a little bit early in the day because with age comes uh, uh, some, some loss of times. But uh, it was just such an incredible season in, in that so many ups and downs. You know, I, I, I know uh, as a young, at the time, a young writer, it was uh, – really always trying to get a handle on what kind of team I was watching, you know, because they were really uh, had some moments of greatness and other moments where they struggled a little bit, but always that this incredible amount of toughness and grit and effort. And uh, some of the moments that stick out with me was a Notre Dame game, obviously um, just a heartbreaking uh, defeat. Um, it was just, you know, excruciating. I can't imagine going through it as a player, because as a writer, I felt exhausted at the end of it. Um, and then, you know, you went on to uh, the Navy game, obviously, was just uh, in all the years of covering Army football and watching Army football, uh, that that 1995 Army-Navy game is probably the, the single best game I've ever seen. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I mean, it was clouded a little bit by Navy's decision to, to go for it on fourth and go from the one. Um with, uh, I forget how much time left, maybe uh, just a few minutes, and uh, they could have made it a, a nine-point game, uh, you know, turn a six-point game into a nine. They went for it, and they had basically a running quarterback throw a, a pop pass that seemed to be an odd choice of uh, uh, play calls. And then Army, though, just held, and, and, you know, they stopped it. They feasted upon it, and then they just went 99 yards. And I, I remember – the next day in the newspaper, we had this uh, big full-page uh, chart that said 99 yards to glory. And I always remember that uh, as, a, as a moment a, when they're fourth down and 24 yards to go on the 25-yard uh, line or four, fourth, fourth and 24 from the 29, maybe. Jim, Jim will have that in the top of his head. <clears throat> and there's a 28-yard pass to John Graves in which uh, – sounds, sounds right to me. a perfectly thrown ball by Makeda. You know, I remember when he threw it, and I watched Graves still hadn't made his cut, you know, and when he made his cut on, like, basically, you know, latter day uh, – at that point – at that time, I think we just called him square outs, you know. <laughs> he did about uh, 20, 20 – 23 yards square out. And as soon as he made the cut, the ball was basically in his arm. You know? uh, uh, just a miraculous win. But that exemplified that that Army team, you know. And, and uh, people will, will credit that Army team forever with laying the groundwork 
for the 96 team and what they accomplished, you know, and I, I know Jim and I have talked about that uh, a lot in the past and, and uh, there's a lot to be said for that. You know, they, they laid the, they, they laid the, uh, the old model of toughness and grit and hard work and uh, being down and, and knowing how to come back and win. I left out the BC game, which was probably one of my fa most favorite games I've ever covered Army football. It went up to Chapel Hill and just destroyed BC. Left, I think it was 42 nothing at halftime. If Bob Sutton wasn't wasn't as nice a fella, it could have been 100 nothing at the end. I think 149-7. Uh, so it was just so many memories. Uh, all my uh, I still say it now. All my all my favorite memories of, of covering sports in 32 years. They, they, just about all of them centered around army football. Yeah, it's uh, it, you know, like it, it reminds me. This team would remind me a little bit of the 2015 team that Jeff Munkin had, where they they took they took their lumps a little bit and played played up to uh, the level of competition, and it turned into that eight and five team that kind of got things going. And now in the Munkin era, um, just just looking at the at the, the BC game, we haven't really talked too much about that game, guys. What, what um, look, Ben Kawika is uh, putting in a little uh, love for you, Adrian. Benny, glad I'm going in. We should, we should, uh, we got to get Ben's email. Um, just talk about the BC game, guys, and what that game, because um, I you said that was the game after the Notre Dame game, right? Or no, and that, that was the game that really uh, showed, showed what this was all about. Well, it all started with the buses breaking down on the way out to BC. Um, I, I don't know if anybody remembers that, but we were late getting up there, and uh, we had like a truncated practice on the uh, field. Oh, that's and right. I forgot the defensive that. line, one of the things we used to do with the defensive line was uh, Coach Dasher would run through ball drills with us. We'd do trip tip drills <laughs> with the defensive line. That was like our thing. But we didn't have time to do it. Um, so then we get into playing BC and we're kicking their butt. Number one, worst butt chewing I've ever gotten at halftime was in the middle of the BC game where we're up 42 to nothing. But um, Bill Dowd dropped like three interceptions, like three solid interceptions right in his hands. And every game after that, we the first thing we started with our warm-ups on Fridays was ball drills with the defensive line. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember the rain. I mean, it rained, it rained, and it rained all day. I mean, I think my feet were waterlogged, and the, on the other yeah. side of that was I think it rained all day, and we didn't fumble the ball once. So mm -hmm. to, to have it all come together in inclement weather uh, up there, and not to mention I mean, we had a fire alarm go off in the middle of the night. Yeah. 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 I mean, of all things, we could. I mean, just buses breaking down. I was ready for, you know, first and 15 for the locusts to line up and then swarm across and, you know, maul us all and take us all away. But, you know, for the past, all the major league. League. <laughs> it was, Yeah, it seems like like that game. Uh, man, you look at uh, the Washington game. Are there any mm. uh, just going out there, I guess, you know, just playing in, you know, the time zone and, and, and giving and putting up a good fight with them? Or I know that. Jim, you said you said that at the beginning that this team, you know, you remember the win, you remember those tough, hard fought games as much as the wins. I mean, is there anything from that Washington game that you know, comes to, comes to mind for you guys? You know, I think that's another game where, you know, if you look at that and and even the Notre Dame game, but the Washington game, just a game we felt where we just ran out of time, which literally we we literally ran out of time. Yeah. Um, on the goal line going in. Um, so I think that was a a tough loss, uh, you know, for us for us to swallow, but I think it made us a better team as well. If I can jump in on that Washington game, um, I, I know for that was one of those uh, games to help set the tone for the season, especially against. Uh, I think they were top twenty at the time, um, maybe twenty two, and <laughs> you know we were we were huge underdogs. Obviously, we just traveled across the entire country. We we're on the West Coast, West uh, Pacific time. And, you know, we, we arrived there. I don't know about you, Tommy B, um, and the rest of the guys, but I was like, their facility was just first class. It, it's, it's what Army kind of has today, just purple carpet everywhere, husky symbols yeah. everywhere. And I was just like, wow, this is incredible. Here we are.
the turf wasn't painted. painted. It was soft. <laughs> well, that I'm sorry. The turf wasn't painted. It was soft, so it didn't no, hurt exactly. your skin. It, it was a plush carpeting turf, and for me, that that game, um, I, I you know, I frustrating game. We 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 Jim, we shut them out. I think we held their rushing because they had some star running back at the time, and I think we held them to under like 50 yards, and he was supposed to run all over us and uh we, we went in there got the job done and um our, our defense stepped up our offense it was a hard fought offensive battle as well i think it was pretty low scoring i think it was 17 18 or something whatever we lost by a point in the end uh, but we're so close to to or a touchdown in the end um but like jim said we were literally seconds and uh, you know thousands of um because it was band day and i think the the volume was so high that the um they couldn't get the snap off in time where they couldn't hear the count. Um, we literally ran out of time. So, but in incredible day, incredible game, and one that left a tone, I think, to show that we can compete with anyone. Yeah, definitely. I think I'm the only offensive guy on this call. Um, looking around now, I just noticed that. Yeah. Um, you know, I just want to, you know, because he's not here, I just feel like I have to mention, like, I think that game um, was where the legend of John Conroy really started. I mean, yeah. you know, we had kind of gone through – you know, a little bit of a, a fullback rotation um, at, from that point. Um, you know, I think D. Perry had started a game and, um, you know, John Conroy was, was starting to get an increasing number of, of plays. And uh, I think that game he had put up, I think, 200, and, 200 yards or something on the, you know, one of the obviously the top ranked defenses uh, in the country. Um, so, you know, just a plug for Johnny Conroy. And, uh, you know, that's what, uh, that's what got him started. Yeah, and, and the offensive line. Yeah, we got no one on the on the call from the uh, from, from the FMC. Yeah, we yeah. lost um, we lost Con Conroy, and we invited Bill Blair, and we don't have Bill Blair yet, but we may be getting another guest soon—a surprise guest. I'm not going to reveal uh, to you guys who it is right now, uh, but maybe um, what. Can you talk to me a little bit about talk to us a little bit about how you guys still keep in touch? I mean, the Army Football Brotherhood is a really tight group. Um, how much have you guys uh, stayed in touch with each other, and how much do when you get together, when you have the chance to get together, talk about you know, like your football memories and maybe even like your memories as you know, as a cadet too at West Point? I think every chance I get, and to me, these guys are sick of me talking. I talk to them. Okay. <laughs> Every time I get a chance to see these guys, I do. And so well, there's Tom Burrell coming up to his sister's house in Connecticut. Uh, sure, I'm going to drink his sister's beer. No problem. Uh, you know, <laughs> I saw him down last year at the Army-Navy game. No problem. Adrian Kalam at the golf tournament. Uh, you know, Joe Triano. Saw him when I went down to see Kansas State in a bowl game. Abdullah Muhammad. I spent time with him at a concert in Detroit. Um, so every time I get a chance to spend time with my guys, and traveling around the army, it enables uh, you know me the chance to do so. Um, but these are the guys that got me through, and it was a really big deal uh, to for me. Hopefully, what they understand is through all this noise, uh, there's something as significant as a is a true friendship that's developed over the last 25 plus years. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to add on to that, I mean, um, you know, this this group uh, is probably, you know, the greatest gift um, I've received, you know, from the academy. You know, I think the more hardship that you get that you go through with a group, like the tighter that bond is, and you know, just this small group of uh, of guys from our class. I think, um, you know, we're we're very tight knit. Um, you know, we've had some things happen over the years where, you know, we've had, we've had some losses in our group and, you know, in the extended family. And, um, you know, what, what really is amazing to see is when, you know, really people will converge like from all over the country um, to support, you know, somebody who's, you know, having a bad time, whether it's a death in the family or um, just a tough time, like people will drop everything um, and will show up with less than a day's notice. So, um, I'm so proud uh, to be part of the group and um, just, it's great. I mean, it's a, it's a great brotherhood. Anybody else like to um, speak about that? Yeah, well, I will say, you know, we, 
at our 20 year reunion, we had an opportunity to really touch base with everybody. But uh, in addition to that, I mean, I, I would definitely say that this class has got to be one of the closest classes um, in history. I mean, we, 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 we do keep in contact. Uh, in fact, uh, we, we had uh, Ed Stover has adopted Bill Blair as his son. Uh, <laughs> so we, uh, which is kind of an inside joke, but uh, but no, but, but no, we, we, we have kept contact. We, we kind of get constant emails from Joe Triano on a financial tip. Uh, I think everybody is uh, everybody has used Jim Cantaloupe's house in Chicago to hang out, uh, you know, in, in between Zop and, and Tommy B. You know, so we 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 really we really kept in contact. And, you know, both our ten year and our twenty year, and I'm hopefully we can get together again. You know, this year twenty five was uh, kind of canceled due to COVID, but looking forward to the next time we can get together. Have you guys, um, any of you, pick up the Civil War book? at any time and just read it over or just um, maybe does that bring up uh, some, some memories or do you guys keep that close to you that just being featured, having an army football team being featured in, in a, in a pretty best, uh, one of a, a best selling book like that. I read it once, but I only read every other chapter because my, my book evidently was broken. There's a whole bunch of stuff about Navy in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah pick it up i mean to tell you the truth is a lot of a lot of the times off the field are, are my more vivid memories uh in between downs or in between so at halftime like washington walking in against washington to share the same tunnel and to hear a top 25 team bicker at each other because they were getting taken to school by the little old army and uh much for for us to you know really kind of take off and um, do some special things you know get out of the blocks hot against Air Force and then to, you know I mean unfortunately not seal the deal I mean some of those things afterwards or beforehand are, are some of the times that I remember the most um, before we even put on pads uh, w- you know we we had home run derby over the summer workouts after you know beating each other to death in the weight room. Running and Derek and Lupe crushing that too, wasn't it? Lupe, Lupe against you know Black Magic over there trying to go yard and <laughs> in, to the end zone stands for the, for their you know home run derby, going to the VA hospital, um, things that meant more than just playing football. Um, I think that's why we're still hanging around. Nice. For anybody, was there an unsung hero on this team? Was there somebody that maybe didn't get enough of a uh, credit that was very vital to f- vital to the team and it? It's success. Um, if, if I can jump in, I, I always, well, not always, I, I try to give credit to the scout team guys. Um, I think we all, most of us paid uh, our, our dues on scout team at some point um, when we suited up for the black and gold. Um, so we, we, uh, we had a handful of firsties who were on the scout team. Um, you know, those guys, day in, day out, it wasn't the funnest role to play. Um, the uniforms that we had back back then, to I don't even know what the material was uh, that it was made of, but just the, uh, the the field conditions and the gear that we had back then, um, and then to to get you know just constantly pounded by starters and um, you know that that mentality that grind for them, you know, helped toughened us and and prepared us for each game. And I so my my hats off to anyone that's ever play that role for an extended period of time, especially those who were on it for three or four years. Um, Aaron Sticky comes to mind. Um, no, Jay Moore. But bottom line, like, anybody yeah. bring Andy Krug. Krug, anybody uh, brings Andy Krug, Krug Jay Moore. Andy Krug comes to mind. Um, so there, there was a bunch of guys who um, get to me on Selling Heroes by being on the scout team. Yeah, absolutely, Adrian. I, I remember the BC game. We were talking about the BC game, but Jay Moore is there in front of his hometown crowd. Uh, I think by the time you know, by the time we got to like the third or the fourth quarter, if you'd have called out the defense, more guys in the BC offense would have known the defense than the guys in our defense. And Jay Moore is out there just like cleaning clocks. Going to town, uh, yeah. I think even right, uh, right. he picked up. I think Sticky, <laughs> if I remember correctly, he might have picked up a sack as well. Uh, that game. Right. 
Right. No, that, yeah, absolutely, Adrian. I'm with you with the scout team, guys. But, uh, yeah, people talk about Rudy from Notre Dame. Rudy was a punk. He only sat there for, like, two years. Like, Jay Moore, man, that guy, four years, dedicated, Put it never even wavered. I would, I would follow him anywhere in the battle. Yeah, Moe is a great guy. Great guy. I mean, I have to, I have to give a plug out to the, uh, to the Fat Man's Club for uh, Unsung Hero. I mean, the thing is that yeah. – yeah. The things that oh they put their body through, okay. <laughs> just the sacrifices they made to get themselves up to 300 pounds um, <laughs> to be able to, you know, function, you know, militarily and, you know, just fit into that uniform and then and then just snap back into shape like the, the rock solid shape that Stover and Joel Davis were, you know, by the end of that school year. Um, shape. Thank you for your sacrifices, Fat Man's Club. Coach Lou. If I remember it correctly, back then, back then the uh, cadets didn't get as much really mess hall time. If I heard it right, they didn't get to really eat the type of meals that they're able to eat now. I think so. It was like major uh, uh, enterprise getting them up to that weight, right? Yeah, it was. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Especially well, different now, man. They eat a little bit better than you did, Adrian Kalam. Coach knows. No doubt. Do you get steaks on Mondays? Do we get steaks on Mondays? Steaks on Monday? Yeah. Yeah, they were from the dog track. They weren't, <laughs> they weren't real stuff. <laughs> hey. Hey. They, they, you know what? I tell you what, Coach Monk has done a phenomenal job now. Like the amount, the amount of effort we put into everything from nutrition and rest and you know they got gps units on their back i mean they're just everything is monitored you know you just you're doing it like a major college football program yeah. so it's a lot it's a lot different than it was back in the day a lot different yeah, yeah. you know yeah. guys are gaining weight not losing it you know so but anyway you guys look good man Good to see you, Coach. Likewise, Coach. 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 I was listening to her for a few minutes. I was fired up when I saw you guys. I love the 95 team, man. That was a good football team now. Yeah. It was. Well, I mean, Coach, you should have kept an eye on Tom Burrell a little bit more. A little bit more monitoring no uh, would have been <laughs> that's awesome good. Yeah, let me. I'll tell you a story, and I, I, I got to keep moving here. I got to get stuff done for West Virginia. But one of the stories I remember more than anything is is Adrian Kalam was hurt, and CWSCs was hurt, and Tommy Burrell is, uh, you know, was ineligible, right, the year before, playing tight end, right? Academically ineligible, yes. Yeah, academically to be ineligible. Sorry to throw you I'm a dumbass. Spot. I was the dumbest guy. No, no. Yeah. But he graduated. So, so I remember I remember this story like it was yesterday, right? So <laughs> we go, you know, we lose to Duke. We tie Rice. We lose to Duke. We lost to uh, Washington, and we lose to Notre Dame. Like literally on the last play of the game. And we wouldn't have lost the Duke game if he had instant replay like he did today. There's no way. Because Count Weekend knocks that ball out, and it's there's no doubt it's a fumble, right? So, anyway, we're we're walking into the stadium for practice, and I remember asking Tommy Burrell, I said, "Tommy, what what's the team's attitude right now? Because we're one three and one, and you know we're a good football team, right? And we're going up to play Boston College, and Coach Sutton did a great job. We watched what we watched like Hamburger Hill, I think during the week and stuff. Like I remember all this, so." But I asked Tom Burrell, like, what, what's the attitude of the team? And he goes, we're just pissed. We're just really pissed. You know what I mean? And we went up there, and I heard you guys talk about it for a minute. We were winning 42-0 to zero at halftime. And then pretty much just celebrated the second half. But there were some pretty good players on that Boston College team. Now, that quarterback played in the NFL for about 20 years. Yeah. So but that, was, that was the start of – something really special because obviously you know guess you guys weren't all here for it but you know we, we were a good football team from there on now and you know really set the stage i think for the next year yep so yeah well, appreciate you sharing that coach yeah right, coach, thanks yeah. for sharing yeah, great great yeah. memory coach. all right well let you guys chat i gotta i gotta get some scouting reports and stuff together but uh get know, it done so, 
I like, that, hey, coach, I like that gear. We got to get some of that gear, coach. No doubt. You can see it? <laughs> yeah, I'm liking that. Yeah, well, I'll tell you why. Coach Munkin does a good job with the gear. Of course, Nike does a really good job with the gear. We're we're supported here pretty good now. Good. Like I said, I, I think that's the biggest thing with Coach Munkin is just that we've – we really have turned it into a – to try to make it as much as possible as you can in Army West Point as a major, major college football program. Yep. You know what I mean? We, we got good coaches and good staff and good support. And it's, you know – I'll leave you with this, too. I mean, I'm convinced you can win here. That's why I wanted to come back. You can win here because the rest of the world's becoming softer and softer every day. <laughs> and, you know, our guys are the last of the hard. You know what I mean? Oh, so, yep. that's – that's right. So that's the difference. We just, I wish we were a little faster this week against West Virginia, but we'll, we'll be tough enough. We can keep up, <laughs> you know, no doubt. Go tomorrow, for the knees. Tomorrow. Go for the knees at the beginning. They'll what's, slow down. What's that? Go for the knees at the beginning. They'll slow down. No doubt. I, I've tried to convince them I would cut block everywhere the first play just to set the tempo. They can only, <laughs> they can only, they can only take one penalty by rule. So, right. We should set the tempo. They'll scare them. We'll, we'll, you know, I think they've only had one guy opt out, but I was hoping if we could get after them enough, they'll have more than – they'll have some of them opt out in the second quarter. <laughs> get out of the way, you know. So, all right, people, all right, I love you guys, man. Come all right, Coach. Great, great team. Right. Good luck. Right, Thank you, Coach. Kev, just, uh, just wanted to ask you real quick, and then I got to run and get my uh, – my uh, laptop charger. Maybe you can carry the conversation a little bit. Um, who was the best guy? Uh, who did you go to for coach on this team? And maybe like I'm guessing, like the fat the fat man's club was a good for the avenue to get quotes from. And I'm sure Jim, one of the captains, was. Talk to us a little bit about who were your go-to guys for you know quotes or stories on that season. Oh, that's that's an easy one. He he's on here. Uh, Jimmy Cantaloupe uh, was always. Uh, Always and forever, a quote machine. Adrian was excellent. I mean, all these guys were really good. Um, that's one of the reasons why I love the, covering this team is because it wasn't like – it wasn't so buttoned down, like, you know, and rehearsed like a lot of even NFL teams now, you know, that, that you see players that are so guarded and uh, worried. And, and, and back in the day, a lot of Army teams were too kind of like that. But that was another thing that was special about – you guys and the 95 team is that, you know, it's kind of like real colorful group of guys, you know, that didn't really worry so much about um, um, saying the right thing, just more worried about saying what was on your mind and telling the truth. Yeah. Uh, that's a dream right there, you know, to uh, have uh, uh, any athlete just basically say what they really are thinking instead of just saying what they think might sound might sound good, you know, and uh, you guys see it now in, in different professional sports, you know, it's just that it's kind of almost like you can predict the answer before it comes out for, for right. so many questions, you know, and uh, a lot of it's the, the, the questions too aren't very good, you know. So um, uh, that's what I loved. Uh, one of the things I loved about this team too is that you guys are like so loose, and um, really uh, provided a ton of storylines. You know, uh, Joe mentioned the Fat Man's Club. I mean, that was uh, that was a writer's dream. You know, those guys. First time I I saw Joel Davis with the uh, FMC on his hat, and I was like, "What the hell? What's the what's the FMC?" You know, he was more than happy to tell me all about it. You know, and uh, I, I think you know he, he proceeded to tell me more about it for the ensuing like eight weeks. You know. But uh, it was such a cool thing, um, uh, you know, with, with you guys covering you. I, I know that uh, it was one of the real uh, joys of, of my three decades. You know, I, I got I had a chance to cover a lot of different things with professional sports, but uh, I really, uh, you know, Sal knows this too, that I, I always go back to these Army teams that were um, – that, you know, they take up all – really dominate all my memories. Kevin, yeah. you can't you can't forget Brian Tucker's quote after the Boston College game. We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about that, Jim. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Brian, uh, the all-time favorite players and favorite uh, uh, quotes afterward when he was telling basically telling the media 
exactly what he thought of Boston College and the, and the lack of heart and fire that, uh, you know, he perceived them to have. And at the same time, Bob Beretta, many of you guys probably still know who was the sports information director at the time. Bob was literally almost rushing in to tackle Brian, as he, you know, basically telling the world about how little he thought of Boston College uh, football and the entire program. Jim, you probably have some details of that quote. Some of it escapes me, but it was uh, it's one of my all-time favorites that you know, he was just spewing. And it was yeah. like the first time I think they let him talk after the game, and it, it might have been the last. And there, here we were in the media saying, just bring on Brian for me. <laughs> I can't believe yeah. I, I almost forgot about Brian. Yeah. yeah. Basically said that, you know, they quit. They had no heart. He was right. disgusted. 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 He was yeah. disgusted. And, and, and obviously. He was right. He, he was right. Bob Sutton was pretty upset, though, too. <laughs> that's, that's right. Coach, Coach let him have it, too, didn't he? He sure did. Well, one of my favorites of that one was the, the motto, right? We're going to take the hill, you know? Taking the uh, hill, yeah. that's that yeah. hill, and um, wow. uh, man, yeah. you guys take the hill. That was a sensational effort. And I, like I said, if Bob wasn't so kind, I think it could have been seventy-five to nothing at the end. I really do. I, I, I think he basically put the break. Cleared the bench. I think I, I yeah. could be wrong, but he really took it easy in the second half. I mean, Kevin, I, even I was tired. I, I got <laughs> even I was tired. You know, I mean, we all got reps. You did. Right down the depth chart. Well, um, we, we haven't talked a lot about Coach Sutton uh, on this uh, on this podcast, and maybe uh, we, we should get into it a little bit. Um, we, we, have a, we have another guest popping in, Mr. Ed Stover popping in. Welcome, Ed. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I really Stand appreciate for, this opportunity yeah. because <laughs> I've heard so much about the FMC – Thanks, Joey T. Some of these guys you know, have talked about the there. FMC. We're, uh, we're all defense, so that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, go ahead. The floor is yours on the FMC. Tell us about how that got started. And uh, yeah, how much did you weigh, Ed? About, I weighed about two thirty-five, two thirty-six. About, <laughs> about, yeah. I'm down. I'm, I'm about. I'm down to two twenty-five now. So yeah, know. plus or minus. I don't know, like fifteen sandbags or something. <laughs> Hey, listen, don't judge me, Tommy B. Don't judge me. I'm just saying, I used to lift with you, and you would never let me see what you weighed. It's not important. It's irrelevant. <laughs> so the FMC got started because uh, at the end of practice, uh, each group would go to their position. And so we had the bad backs and the, the defensive backs and the D-line. DBs. DBs, right? Um, and so for the FMC, uh, we'd say stay fat. Uh, it was one of our things that we just wanted to make sure that we uh, laid the fat on people and moved people. So that was that was our job, and that's what we wanted to do. And uh, it was impose our will on on the other team. And at the end of the day, at the end of the, each game, uh, we wanted to make sure that they understood that this was you know this was Army football. We were going to lay the fat on you. We were going to move you, and we were going to get our three to four yards of carry. And uh, and every now and then we're going to break one and and uh, try to break your will. So that's how we played the game. One of my all-time favorite Bob Sutton quotes was, he said, all we need to get is 3.35 yards of carry. And at first he said 3.3. I said, no, coach, that's going to leave you. That's going to leave you a little short of the first down. <laughs> now uh, make it 3.35 yards of carry. There were games where it seemed like you guys averaged about 3.5 and still won handily. With, uh, you know, 400 yards rushing on it. I, I think that's our strategy. Uh, I think that, you know, if you look at Coach Munkin's team now, it's uh, it's very similar to that, right? If he gets if he gets to fourth and one and he's on the other side of the 50, he's going for it. Uh, he believes that uh, he can get one yard. And so uh, that's that's really important. And I think it, it explains exactly what Coach Luce just said, uh, the last of the hard. We called ourselves the national champions of toughness, and uh, that's Army football. But the thing I'll throw out there, too, on top of uh, what Ed keeps talking about, the laying the fat on people, right? Like, okay, um, having gone through the ones versus twos and offensive line versus defensive line, there was a huge difference between an athletic man 
at 300 pounds coming off the ball three feet off the ground trying to take your head off versus a Notre Dame stand up at 300 pounds and just grab you and hope that the guy is behind him as fast, fast enough to like beat you outside. Uh, I would have taken the Notre Dame game all day long because our guys were coming out to, to, to hurt somebody. And that's what I always appreciated about the FMC. I, I think that the, if we really talk about it, if you look at our defense, you look at our, our style of play, it was attacking. Um, it was a little bit honey badgerish, right? Like we weren't going to be the biggest guys. We weren't going to be the fastest, but we were going to die trying or you're going to have to kill us. And, that, and that's the way we played the game. You know, just that relentless <clears throat> approach on defense, cantaloupe running the alley, you know, laying hats on people. Uh, our defense just attacking, attacking, attacking. And then our uh, offensive line just pounding and pounding and pounding. And then when you get through with that, you know, Ronnie McKay sits back and drops a whole pass on you. Um, I think that's Army football from back then. And if you look now, I think that the pattern is kind of the same, right? They just pound the rock and pound the rock. And, you know, every now and then we're going to hit a pass and we're going to try to break your back and break your will. If I can add one thing going back on the defensive comment. So that uh, spring of 95, um, Coach T um, Dornboss uh, implemented the 4-6, uh, Arizona's uh, bear down defense. And um, Lupe, you remember this, where we were, what were we running the year before? Four, four, three, something like that, or three, four. And it, it wasn't that effective at being an attacking defense, but I think the bear defense fit to what we had to offer as far as, uh, you know, being tenacious and our, our physicality, being smaller, but being quicker and exploiting a lot of the gaps in our, uh, in our opponent. Um, and I think that played to our advantage again with, with that gap assignment responsibility and just getting the linebackers in there. Um, especially we, we had a, you know, we had smaller, smaller linebackers, smaller linemen. Um, and I think that's what helped, helped us have a, a really solid defense uh, throughout that season, despite a lot of the close games. I mean, two, two guys we haven't got a chance to talk about, you know, Bill Dowd and Al Roberts on the both sides. Yeah, of the ball. Exactly. And not tremendously big people, but extremely athletic, you know, get their hands on you in two seconds and they're by you. So to me is. Uh, just like you said, as far as the speed, taking all the – I mean, doing everything we could possibly do to maximize what the defense was. And, you know, just under-the-radar guys all attacking is a, is a pretty pretty impressive defense. And don't forget Colin Kearns uh, and Nose Guard and Eichelberger from uh, – and Heist Gibson from the 90 – or the next season, 97, uh, 97 class. They'll get their time to talk next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, you could. A book has been written about this team, and I think you could probably write you know a second a second book or at least additional chapters from what we've uh, talked about tonight. Um, I was just going to ask you guys, and Ed mentioned this a little bit in his comments. Um, as uh, as you know, Army football grads, so to speak. What do you you guys can uh, chime in on this? What What do you like the most about this edition of the Black Knights? Um, this uh, 2020 edition of the Black Knights. What have you seen in them? that maybe reminds you a little bit of the 95 team or we just, what do you like about their, uh, their season and their, and their, their style of play or what, what they have done, what they've accomplished this year so far. So I know I was last to the call, but I'm going to be first to comment on this one. Um, I'll tell you one thing I love uh, and maybe it goes along with my personality, but when coach Munkin laid down the line and said, Hey, look, we'll play him in the PX parking lot. I mean, I started sending out text messages to this group because I got so fired up. Uh, I'm not going to say I started putting my head through any walls or windows or anything, but it was it was really kind of nice that just that attitude of it doesn't matter where we play or, or what field we're on. If you want some, you can get some, and, and we'll play you any place, any time. And they proved that, right? They, they took Air Force in after having, you know, I would say, you know, it wasn't a stellar a Navy game honestly, but they won it. And then they came back the next week against Air Force. And you know what? They won that one too. And so that's, that's what I appreciate about this team right now is that they find a way to win the game and they come to play each week. So that's, that's my two cents on it. Uh, 
I, I would say, you know, ultimately, this is what we're looking for as a nation, as, a, as an institution. This is what we're looking for guys to get out of playing Army football is exactly what Ed was talking about. You find a way to win, right? Because losing is not an option. And guys are just completely like, I don't even know how to express it because it's just there, there is, it's just not an option to lose. So you go out there and you're going to figure out a way to make things happen and make things make and, and win and do what you need to do. Um, you know, I, I don't know about everybody else in the call, but you know, I saw that in <clears throat> Afghanistan and Iraq from, you know, guys in our class. I mean, Ben Kotwika, Ben Kotwika was flying Apache helicopters when I was in uh, Baghdad, um, you know, and then guys from other classes where, it, you know, you just, you see that, you see that mentality of the, the only option is winning. So let's just go out there and we're going to figure out how to do it. Um, and, and that's what I see out of the teams that, that you know, the, the last few years of what coach monkin has been putting on the field is guys that just understand that they, they, they get it when, you know, it, it's always about, Hey, this guy gets it. These guys get it. You know, they, they get it. They, they go out there and they find a way to, to make it happen and, and don't, they're not going to settle on excuses. They just find a way to win. Yeah. I mean, I think this team just really embodies, you know, what coach Munkin is all about. Um, just absolute toughness, just showing up every week and just saying, hey, we came here to chew bubble gum and kick ass and, and we forgot our bubble gum. So, you know, they just come looking for a fight every week. Um, just so proud um, of where this program has come, you know, just to be able to, you know, I'm here in Arizona. Um, just the fact that I get to turn on the TV every week and be able to watch Army um, to see, you know, how this program has, you know, really grown in stature. And, you know, it's a place where, you know, I don't consider myself a great athlete, but it's a place where great athletes want to come now, um, you know, because, you know, it's it's a destination um, and it's a place where now, um, you know, you can go pro if you want um, and if you're good enough. But, um, you know, really, it's, it's just a lot of like minded people um, who embody their coach um, and just can't say enough great things about Coach Monk. <laughs> My favorite thing about the the this team this year is in two consecutive weeks on both sides of the ball and in special teams is a fourth down stop goal line stand on the defensive side and then punching it through on fourth and the goal on the offensive side against our you know academy rivals in consecutive weeks when those are the most draining games emotionally uh, that you could possibly ever imagine and in both critical situations uh, I think this team knows how to step on other teams next. When it's time to, when there's blood in the water, it's attack. And I think that defense really stepped up. I mean, third and goal, fourth and goal. And then when we needed a drive, when we would drive so well against Air Force and seemed to sputter out in three quarters, when we needed a drive for 75 yards and punch it in on fourth and, and goal, I, I didn't have a doubt. And I don't think these players have a doubt. And so this, this team is, they believe they can win every time they go out. And uh, I can't wait to play West Virginia. Can any of you guys imagine what it would be like to play for Jeff Munkin? I mean, is it uh, a little bit? Is he a little bit different than uh, different? Definitely seemed like a little bit different than Coach Sutton, right? He's uh, for me. He so we had we had Coach Ted Dasher, Tom, and I had Ted Dasher back in the day. You know. Uh, he brought the intensity, but he also brought the love. And I think Coach Munkin does that as well. If you screw up, he will jack you up in a heartbeat. Um, but at the same time, he will give praise and a lot of love and respect for, you know, um, for when you performed and, get, you know, got the job done on the field. Um, something else I'd like to comment, too, and I think I mentioned with this uh, to you before, Sal, is that um, one of the – and I mentioned the underdog uh, mindset of this team or of, of all Army teams. And I think this team also exemplifies that where you have a lot of players who have um, come off the bench, whether at the quarterback position, whether at the fullback through injuries or, or whatever, 
Um, you, you see a lot of these players who weren't planning on playing or playing on even dressing for the game step up and do incredible things. Um, and I'll point my man Tom out again. Um, you know, I was starting the going into the Notre Dame game, and Tom, are you, are you even over 200 yet, 200 pounds? Or were you over 200 pounds back in the day? You know, he came in. And he was he was the ass kicker. Apparently, thing. So I'm not going to say what I really want to <laughs> say, Adrian. But so that that's that's just demonstrated throughout um, throughout you know most army seasons where you know kids with who are kind of overlooked and not given a shot, but when they step up on that field, when they step on Mikey, uh, they God bless them, they get the job done. And this team, uh, the 2020 team, has definitely got uh, gotten that job done. Um, especially with the leadership of the first season, um, you know, salute them and salute the coach for for this winning mindset that we have now um, back at back at Army. So it's it's a beautiful thing. Hey Sal, uh, you asked, uh, you know, how, how would I like to play for Coach Munkin? And I, I, you know, I think we had we were blessed with some beautiful coaches at at Army while we were there. If you just look at the the guys that followed on and what they did afterwards, I mean, or where they're at now. It's not. There's no question that we had a we were had a tremendous group of coaches. But I gotta tell you, um, like when when Coach Munkin talks, um, I can't remember what, exactly what game it was, but uh, he he started this chant in the locker room, and before I realized that I was jumping up and down in my house, and I was like, you know, we will fight, you know, and yeah. I started getting all hyped up, and and you know, I I, I think that uh, it'd be awesome to have that kind of energy. Uh, to start uh, to start the game or to play with, but um, overall, I just got to say that one, we were blessed with some wonderful coaches, and two, uh, the team now is doing great things. Um, I love that phrase, "the last of the hard," because that embodies what the Army football player is. You know, uh, not everyone can do what we do, uh, and that means you know whether that's we're going to do summer training and then go play football, or hey, we're going to be football players and we're going to be you know. Um, I'm not going to say I was a mechanical engineer major, but we do have those on the team. Um, you know, it's one of those things where everybody doesn't choose this lifestyle. Um, and only the, only the special ones do. And, uh, that's what it means to be an army football player. And I can only imagine what it's like playing with coach Munkin and him kind of saying those things that, you know, speak right to that spirit of, Hey, we're, we're the last of the hard. No doubt. Um, I was talking to uh, James Nautical uh, last week, uh, Army linebacker from a couple of years ago, and what the locker room was like during I, I Want to Fight when they beat Temple. You know, he's like, he's never been around anything like that. And then they had another win uh, when they beat Georgia Southern. They did this, they did the 2020 version of it, right? And I think there was an assistant coach maybe on the top of a locker, uh, on top of a locker or something, pumping his hands up and stuff like that. It's, it's really amazing to, to be, um, I guess, it, uh, just covering it, and Kevin and I have covered it for for years. I mean, it's just amazing about the brotherhood and what that can, like, look at, just to hear you guys tonight with your stories and your reflections on your season, you know, 25 years ago, and now the, um, to hear your, your your respect for this for this year's team too uh, goes a long way. Um, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up in a few minutes, guys. You have any other things you'd like to add off the top of your head, just about this team and. Uh, just about some memories. You have any uh, last thoughts, so to speak? So, Sal, one thing, and we got away from it before, but um, this year I've seen uh, – I had Thanksgiving dinner with Joe Triano because my son was playing hockey down there. Um, turned that around, and I watched the Air Force game with uh, Fat Bill Blair uh, in Dallas. Um, Jim Cantaloupe turned around, and, you know, I called him up one day, and he squared me away on – on just kind of life and give me some you know, pointers and uh, Zop and I talk and, you know, it's not, it's not every football player I can get into it with about uh, hockey, but Zop keeps up with it. So he and I watch a, I think a Stanley cup game together. Uh, Adrian's walking me through my, my daughter's uh, little league soccer. And uh, I, I still have Abdullah Muhammad's key to his house. And I haven't lived in Detroit in, in probably 11 years. So, I mean, when you want to talk about the brotherhood, man, I, it, it really does embody what what this group of guys is. And and I stopped there, but there's surely there's story after story. And you know, 
I, I, I love these guys as brothers. Um, do anything for them. If I, if I flew into a city and one of them were there, then, you know, it's a matter of not if I'm going to see them. It's just a matter of how much time I'm going to get a chance to see them. Um, and that's what we do for each other, right? Uh, I, I think that if you look at Army football players, this is the difference. I'm pretty sure that Peyton Manning knows some of the guys on his team. Um, and uh, one, one second, one second. I was in Dallas. I watched Air Force with, uh, with Bill Blair. But the next day, I went to a different arena, and uh, Derek Klein ran up and jumped in my arms like jumped in my arms, a grown man and the parents on my team were like, holy smokes, that grown man just jumped into your arms. And I, I hope you know him. Um, so, yeah, I know him. He's one of my brothers. So, um, but I was, I, I was saying. He's that, like a third of your size. <laughs> but yeah, it's fine. I, I'm about third, maybe half, but that, we don't need to get in the numbers, Tommy B. Um, so long story short though, I, I mean, it's, it really is special. What, Peyton Manning played with a bunch of guys at Tennessee and, I, you know, this is no disrespect to him, but I'm pretty sure that if he were to fly into Indianapolis, it doesn't matter if the guy was third team, scout team, or whatever. If that was an Army football player and I flew there, I'm going to find him. It's, it's almost like I know that he's there. I'm going to be in the town and I'm going to look him up. And that's what that's the difference about playing at Army and playing at University of Georgia, playing at Tennessee. It, this is This is what the brotherhood is about. I think it's dates and points on a map. So, I mean, Army Football Club Golf Tournament, you know, we'll see you guys there. It's an open invitation. It's our annual reunion. Army-Navy game is a lock. Uh, Army Air Force next year in Fort Worth, that's a lock. <clears throat> and I'll see you all in Madison, Wisconsin. So, Tommy B., sorry I didn't make Michigan, but we're going to see you in Madison, Wisconsin. Yeah. Hell yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, and if Tommy makes it, if we can get Al Roberts to make it, everybody's going. Oh, my going. God. Right? So – if if anybody yeah. can summon Al Roberts, please, you uh, know. I, I did Al. hear from Al uh, this past summer as he he got married online, um, and I think he's doing quite doing quite well uh, in Boston, working for a uh, financial firm as a big wig exec. So he's he's doing great. I was there for the criminal night, by the way. <laughs> the criminal. <laughs> <laughs> that story will not be told, Tommy. Baby. No, not tonight. No, no. Hey, hey. Cold doors. She's fire. She's fire. <laughs> hey, Sal, that's it. Let's cut us off, man. Let's wrap this thing up. All right. So is it time to wrap it up, then? Is it time to wrap it up? <laughs> I love you guys, man. Thanks for making it, Ed. See, yeah, I, knew you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew you'd make it, Eddie. <laughs> Really appreciate you guys uh, coming on and reconnecting, and it's been great to have like like I said, maybe it didn't happen at the at the Navy Army Navy game this year, but at least we were able to get a, a bunch of us together to share some thoughts about your season and uh, what what's going on with the Black Knights, uh, the current Black Knights. Uh, we're gonna wrap this podcast up. Thanks again, guys, for jumping on. Special thanks to Kevin Gleason for hopping on with his memories of covering this team, and uh, we're gonna have some podcasts coming up this week. Um, with Steve Anderson, Josh McNary is going to come on tomorrow night to talk with Steve Anderson about uh, 2010 Armed Forces Bowl, and we're going to um, preview the uh, West Virginia game, and we're going to do a um, uh, game day preview and a game day post game of the uh, of the Liberty Bowl. Let's see if the Black Knights can get win number ten. Appreciate you guys hopping on tonight. Thank, Thank you, West Virginia. Thanks for having us. Thanks. 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 Beat West Virginia and beat Navy. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the Black Knight Nation podcast with your host, Sal Interdonato. For more information on your Army Black Knights, visit blackknightnation.com.